it on a tripod or anything and and it, like her phone just kept falling over and she was like you know what <laughs> forget it <laughs> just yeah disregard yeah. it yeah cool all right well um we'll let, let's get stuck into it um so well welcome everyone to yet another episode of the boost your biology podcast Today I'm joined in with Dr. Kerry Jones, all the way from Portland, Oregon. Um, she is what I would consider a the queen of hormones. Um, she probably publishes the most amount of content around like women's hormonal health, cortisol, um, and even thyroid health as well. So, Dr. Kerry Jones, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm glad that we were able to connect and it's unfortunate we couldn't see each other live in person this year but we'll have to settle for cameras instead yeah we were just having a chat um before this episode um about the last time kerry jones was actually in melbourne um so you were supposed to be here like this time right yeah, yeah my last time there was 2018 and i took 2019 off from australian travel and i was supposed to be there twice this year 2020 and um the world had a different Stay in it. <laughs> yeah, of course. So do you want to give my listeners a bit of a background into, I guess, like your journey um, into where you, where you are today? Absolutely. I, so right now I'm the medical director for Precision Analytical, the creators of the Dutch test. And I've been with them pretty much since the beginning. They're a dried urine uh, comprehensive hormone test. And we now have the cortisol awakening response, which is done in saliva. So we have a combo test as well. And what happened was I got into naturopathic medicine kind of on a fluke, believe it or not. I was headed towards conventional medicine, realized that kind of medicine was not the medicine for me, um, found naturopathic medicine, and then found hormones and realized that was an area. Endocrinology was my passion. Uh, I was good at it. I understood it. And I really wanted people to understand it. I really felt like hormones... Um, a lot of men and women just didn't understand their body and they just didn't even understand the basics of their body. And I have a lot of men and women who write me in social media and say, I'm embarrassed to admit I'm 35 and didn't know that I or just found that out or I'm 44 or I'm 52. And so one of my huge, huge goals is just education. It's just to help people understand even the complex stuff at a basic level so that they're like, okay, this is how my body is functioning. And now I can have these conversations with my practitioner or when I do research or when I read books to understand it better and what can I do to optimize my health. Mm. And as a result of all of that, I found Dutch found me in 2012 and we've kind of grown together since then. Awesome. So do you want to maybe give my listeners a bit of a, an understanding into, I guess, adrenal fatigue um, and maybe like, <laughs> I know you've spoken about it a million times, um, but yeah, do you want to give them a bit of a, an understanding onto that term itself? Yes. So first and foremost, I will say, because I get, I, when I first came out with the idea that the adrenal fatigue didn't exist uh, years ago, um, what I didn't clarify enough is that the symptoms are very real. I'm not debunking anyone feeling tired and I'm not debunking... Um, you know, that you feel burnt out or unmotivated or you're very sick. I 100% believe you. But the term adrenal fatigue, unless you have Addison's disease, Addison's is the autoimmunity where you actually can't make cortisol, but your actual adrenal cells, um, they, don't, they don't generally fatigue out. What we should call it, it's just not as sexy, is adrenal insufficiency or HPA axis insufficiency, so hypothalamic pituitary adrenal. So there's insufficient signaling or there's insufficient output um, to, to getting cortisol. Generally, it starts in the brain. But, and, and then that's, so that's sort of where a lot of my education comes around because everyone is hammering at the adrenal glands. And I'm like, well, but the signal, the signal starts at the top. The signal starts in the brain, which means brain health is critically important to all things hormone, not just cortisol, but to all things hormone. And I think it's an area until somebody develops brain fog, dementia, Alzheimer's, it gets neglected. Mm -hmm. And if we have to start with brain health, because that's really where it, it all goes for cortisol. And so the other interesting thing with the idea behind quote unquote adrenal fatigue is there's a feedback loop. If you've had really high cortisol, there is a negative feedback loop, which means the brain goes, wow, that's a lot of cortisol. I'm going to shut it down and it will stop signaling and therefore cortisol production will go down. 
And so when people come to me with very low cortisol, and it's not Addison's, I will say, did you have, did you have a really stressful situation? Have you been stressed out? Have you been fighting something in the past? Because I would imagine if I would have tested you a year ago, six months ago, two years ago, it would have been a lot higher. And mm. so with the concept of adrenal fatigue, um, again, I'm a stickler on education. So I want people to understand it starts in the brain and unless it's Addison's, like your adrenals, they don't just they don't just, um, they're not like the ovaries. They don't go through menopause, right? They don't just like give up one day. Um, they, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a myriad of things that sort of goes wrong. And it, a lot of it involves signaling. Mm. And that's what I want people to understand um, that adrenal fatigue is easy to say. It's easy to write about. It's a sexier term. It's way easier to say in an HPA axis insufficiency. Yeah. But as long as you understand the why, like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Then, then that's my whole goal. Cool. So I've always actually sort of wondered with, um, in the extreme case of like, let's say PTSD, where somebody's had like a really severe shock um, or a really traumatic event. And like, I've always wanted to know basically what happens to like the body. Does it decide to completely shut down cortisol or does it actually go into a hyper overdrive sort of state? It does both. <laughs> so, and it, dep and it depends over time. So especially with PTSD, the acute, um, the faster acute reaction and the longer time um, where a person still experiences P PTSD, but it's been further from the event, it's more blunted. It does change what we call the cortisol awakening response. And again, it does start with triggering in the brain. A lot of it can start with triggering the brain and particularly our gland called the amygdala, which is our fear based or emotion based um, gland that centers around fear. And so with PTSD, we get this hyper uh, triggering out of the amygdala. And when the amygdala freaks out uh, for any reason, then one of the triggers is make adrenaline, make cortisol, make it quickly. Let's, you know, like this is a panic situation. But as PTSD, what they find is like it's further and further away from the event. It does, the, the body, um, it, it almost adapts, but it doesn't necessarily adapt in a healthy manner. It's more of a protective manner, um, mm. even though the person still struggles. Interesting. Because, um, I mean, I, I ended up delving into some research myself um, in regards to overtraining and, and like overexercising in regards to um, the parasympathetic and sympathetic response. Yes. Um, and I found that overtraining can actually induce a state of hyper parasympathetic state, like a overly parasympathetic. So do you want to explore that a little bit? Yeah. And in fact, well, we know it on an acute basis, um, right? The um, vasovagal response, right? And so in an acute situation, maybe I think for the listeners, they've maybe understood this before. Have you ever been, um, have you ever been in a hot room, dehydrated, and you stand up and you immediately feel kind of dizzy, or maybe you've passed out, or you've had a, sh or in a different situation, you've had a shock, something really scary has happened, and you've like either passed out or felt very faint. That's called what we call a vasovagal response. And so what happens is you get this sympathetic response, which is the fight or flight, the go response, right? You stand up in a hot room, the body's like, woo, we got to deal with this. And so you get the sympathetic response, and then you get a countering Mm. parasympathetic so it's it's a too much sympathetic it's a too much fight or flight you get the countering parasympathetic and the countering is it's like a bigger tidal wave as opposed to like a baby wave and so the bigger tidal wave takes over and what happens is you pass out <laughs> and right because it's it's your your, your it's a, it's um it went a little too far and but what happens with overtraining is something similar so i was just reading research about overtraining and reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria and how low to moderate training is what the mitochondria kind of like. And then as you get into overtraining, you get an excessive amount of react reactive oxygen species production because of ATP production. And so now the body has to counter back against that. And so with overtraining, you do get this, uh, it's, a it's all protective, right? It's all a protective counter resistance for you and you will hear people i'm sure you hear it i'm sure people who are listening who are guilty of overtraining or have done it in their past that they know when they've done too much overtraining they feel it like things it stops working and they'll start to tell you the like instead of losing weight they're gaining weight they're getting squishier they're getting injuries they're not sleeping as well they're tired they can't recover whereas 
maybe six <clears throat> months prior, they were feeling on top of the world. Everything was great. They felt amazing. They were getting this lean physique. And, and so they kept going because, of course, why not, right? More is better. And then the body's like, whoa, absolutely not. And it pushes back. Mm. So then what about we sort of delve into, I guess, um, the electrolytes? Because I know, I mean, personally, with um, I have a, a, a strong desire for salt. Like I, I need a lot of salt <laughs> yeah. to keep the blood pressure stable and to keep my just general health um, on point. So do you want oh, to sort really? of explore how... <laughs> <with that? laughs> How's your cortisol? <laughs> it's actually super low. So uh, yeah, I was gonna say, but it is. <laughs> do you want to explain that relationship between like some of the electrolytes, even some of the blood work that you can just by looking at blood work, you can sort of see um, somebody's cortisol. So one of the so we always think when we talk about adrenals, we always think cortisol first and foremost. Just in and then, but what we forget is the adrenal glands also make what's called aldosterone, and aldosterone manages our salt uh, salt water balance, and so. If you have a low or insufficient HPA axis, so cortisol is low, the signaling is low, likely, not always, but likely you will also have low aldosterone. And what that means is you're not going to retain onto your sodium, your salt, like you normally would. It will go out in your urine and you will instead retain your potassium. Now, some people are like, well, I like potassium, right? And I thought potassium was good. It is, but it has to be in balance with sodium. And so what we do when you have low cortisol, like yourself, is that we tell people one of the good ways if you have low cortisol and you're trying to work with your adrenal health is to do some, uh, they either do take electrolytes in the morning or you know, doing sea salt in some warm water in the morning, eating quality salt um, on your foods because you're, you're losing salt essentially by having low aldosterone. And by replenishing the salt, it's actually quite nourishing and helpful in the whole process um, and actually even can, you know, relieve some of that stress of having low sodium. So mm. one is just that you said you, you're craving salt. You, you, you know, some people, I've even had people tell me like they could, they, like they wish they could just have a salt lick, like if like deer, you know, like a deer salt. They're like, I wish I'm so, I just crave salt so much. I wish I was like, wow, I think you have cortisol problems. Yeah. We have adrenal problems. We need to work on this HPA axis problems. But you can also look in blood work as well. I mean, you can test sodium, you can test potassium, you can yeah. look at electrolytes and blood work and yeah. kind of get a feel for what's going on. At one point, um, my sodium cravings were so strong that it, it literally tasted sweet. I was, I was literally, I put salt on my chicken. I was like, hmm, this is sweet chicken. <laughs> and, then, and then you're like, and then your science mind kicks in and you're like, wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> this is a problem. Yeah. yeah. And people will notice it. They'll, t I mean, they'll say when I go to stand up, I feel lightheaded. I feel like I get heart palpitations. Um, not because of it's cardiovascular, but because the, you go to stand up and the body's like, I don't have, I don't have the, um you know, the oomph to, to get your, your, um, blood circulating around. They'll get dizzy easily. Um, maybe even be prone to headaches. Um, all because they just don't have the electrolyte balance that they need. Mm. Now, obviously electrolytes are very important for her, for heart rhythm, um, which is partly where the heart palpitations come in. But also, if you just don't have the volume, you know, the blood, the volume, because you, when, you, when you urinate out, you know, water, salt follows water. So when you're urinating it all out, then you're losing out on that volume to get circulated around. Yeah. So then sort of in that sort of scenario, let's say somebody does have extremely depleted cortisol um, and aldosterone, according to like a Dutch test, what sort of... Um, how would you go about, and obviously not giving medical advice, but how would you go about looking at that individual and being like, where, where, should, where would you start with that? Yes. So the first thing is stop exhausting yourself, right? Because these individuals can sometimes, as we know, they still push it. I, I in, in the, the type of patient that I would see, it was oftentimes very organized, very type A, very go-getter type of and often women and so and nowadays when i'm when i'm talking to women they are not only trying to manage 2020 they're trying to manage schooling their children at home and they're trying to manage running a business or running a house or keeping their job or whatever it is and so they have really low cortisol and they just keep pushing i'm like okay you need to literally stop i need you to really focusing on nourishing things i need you to hit the no button i need you to set boundaries i need you to get a lot of sleep, like a lot of sleep. You need to rest and recover. But one of the good things we can do is we can use um, like 
free or each, you know, low cost uh, support to really help um, improve their rhythm and just improve the feelings that the body is like, wow, I, I'm, I'm pretty burnt out. I'm, I'm not going to make cortisol right now. So for example, sun, natural sunlight, right? We, we talk about it all the time. It's that full spectrum light. When you, when you make cortisol in the morning, the triggering event is when you open your eyes and light comes in. So I joke to people all the time, your brain, what, what um, dictates what we call your, your, clock, your circadian rhythm, you're up in the morning, down at night, are your clock genes, uh, like the clock on your wall. And the clock genes are driven by light exposure and dark exposure. They're not driven by ashwagandha. They're not driven, right, by magnesium. They're not driven by um, ketogenesis. You know, they're not driven by high intensity workouts. They're driven by light and they're driven by dark. So I tell people, give the clock genes what they want. So when you're completely exhausted and burned out, I need you to sleep in complete darkness, take care of yourself. And then in the morning, I need you to get up and I need you to open your blinds. I need you to look, you know, be at, go outside for a couple of minutes. I need you to buy a full spectrum light box or um, an alar full spectrum alarm clock that will light up, gradually light up your room with that light. Not the, not the light that's on your phone, not the blue light that's on your phone, but like full spectrum, which is a big difference. If you look at images online of what full spectrum, it looks like the rainbow. We just, to the naked eye, it just doesn't look that way. Mm. So that's like the first thing I tell people. So that's the signal. So use the signal. Now, as you said, electrolytes can be really good things. Sodium can be a really good thing. Having a little bit of, um, you know, sea salt or a quality salt, first thing, a quarter, te well, we in teaspoons <laughs> over here, right? Like a little bit of teaspoon of, of uh, salt in a little bit of water um, every morning can be really helpful it, it taking that off. And of course, on top of that, um, cortisol is actually made in the mitochondria. And we learned in school that mitochondria are our cellular powerhouses and they make our energy and they do ATP, but they're also where our cortisol start and stop. And our mitochondria are very picky. They're very finicky. They're very influenced. They don't like chemicals at all. So pay attention to what's in your skincare and your healthcare and what you've um, like your body care, what you clean your house with, what you, um, you know, like the air fresheners you hang in your car, like maybe don't do that. Your candles, you know, what you do as a hobby, how you take care of your garden, that those all can negatively affect your mitochondria. Your mitochondria really like oxygen, really important for them. So if you are snoring, if you have sleep apnea, if you breathe through your mouth on the regular, if you shallow breathe, if you've got your neck tilted forward all the time because you're on your phone or on your computer or tablet, you're cutting off oxygenation. It's reducing the amount of oxygen. Mm. So make sure you are focused on your posture and getting good breath in. Our mm. mitochondria really like cold. So end your showers in a little bit of cold, right? Do you take a cold shower? Do 30 seconds of cold at the end? Our mitochondria really like sunlight. So if it's sunny where you are, go outside, get a little sunlight, not only for the natural light, but for your, um, for your mitochondria production. Um, your mitochondria really like intermittent fasting, something to consider uh, depending on the person. It may be too much, especially if you're really depleted in cortisol, but you know, maybe once or twice a week, if it works for you, try intermittent fasting. Mm. So there's, the great thing is there's a, like a lot of these things I've mentioned, other than maybe buying a very inexpensive light box if it's dark when you get up in the morning, are, are fairly um, free, <laughs> you know, and, and and are the basics and people laugh at me and they're like, really, I just have to go outside for like 10 minutes in the morning or I just open my blinds and it can be helpful. I'm like, well, it's not magic right away, but you know, give it a couple weeks. And yeah. And they're like, really, if I end my showers in cold water, or if I take a cold shower here and there, I'll feel better. I'm like, yeah, try it. It's just a shower worth a shot, you know, like you got a shower anyway. So it's, it's these basics that can be helpful on top of what you eat how you hydrate, you know, things like other choices you make, supplements you take. Obviously, all those things are important too. Mm. But when we're talking about trying to restore yourself, this is what I go for, the basics. Yeah, yeah, it really does come back to that. Um, and, you know, I'm glad you mentioned diet because I sort of want to segment into um, diet and understand, pick your brain in terms of understanding how certain types of diets can influence um, cortisol. So let's, let's sort of start with a low carbohydrate diet. <laughs> right. You know, I will be honest when it comes to diets, any diets, and I get asked this all the time because I work at a lab. So we get asked all the time, like, 
what does cortisol look like for somebody who's low carb or vegetarian or keto or paleo? And honestly, it depends if you are at the beginning of it, if you're doing it right, or if you've adapted. And, it, and, and so there, we don't see trends or patterns. Like I could not tell you, oh, everybody in keto looks like this because it really depends on their hormones. It depends on their stress levels. It depends on their sleep and their sleep patterns as well. And so there's no, um, in my unprofessional opinion, there's no perfect diet when it comes to cortisol, but it does, it, it does depend on the person and it does take trial and error to see. I mean, I absolutely have people that say, I tried low carb as an example. I tried low carb. I felt worse. I got headaches. I was, dry. I couldn't sleep, you know, and then other people we know just thrive on it. It's, they feel amazing or they go full on keto and they just, everything works really, really well. Or they're vegetarian, um, which I do, I will say I find just in general in hormones, my vegans and my pretty extreme vegetarians are probably my toughest. Um, I, re I respect their choice, but it's, they're also probably the, the, can be the toughest to work with when it comes to hormones. Um, but it, I still couldn't tell you that I see a cortisol pattern with them. Like, oh, what? all the vegetarians are burned out. Why, why do you think that's the case? Like with the, the vegan vegetarian diet? Like what, what, I what think you... a lot of it is just, is the a, a missing nutrients that they think they're getting and uh, on lab work, not always, but often we see that they're not. Um, the type of protein um, and fats, and we know like cholesterol uh, is required for making hormones. Um, the signaling to the brain for women, there's a hormone called leptin Leptin is released by our fat cells, and it is one of the big signaling hormones to tell the brain it is safe enough for her to have a menstrual cycle um, and to become pregnant. Um, it doesn't, leptin doesn't get a lot of press, but it should because it's a really important hormone for women and menstrual cycle regularity. Um, and so I find that the, my vegans and, and pretty hardcore vegetarians struggle with a lot of that with balance. Again, not all, not all, but if I had to pick a group that I, Oftentimes I'm like, you know, and they're like, oh, by the way, and I'm vegan. I'm like, I knew it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course you are. Yeah. Okay. But obviously all um, people, all I should say dietary choices, you know, I mean, I have people who are, you know, keto and, and a, a hot mess. I have people who are paleo and a hot mess right. because just so much else goes into it. You just, mm. um, especially with, with women and hormones, um, it's just so much more. I was going to say complicated, but uh, comprehensive. Let's say that we're comprehensive. <laughs> so um, what about, because obviously um, for my listeners, they may not be familiar with the thyroid. So do you want to sort of explore the relationship between the thyroid and our adrenals? Yeah, absolutely. They're best friends. Uh, they talk all day long and they 100% support each other or can get in each other's way. Mm. So let's on testing, um, especially on Dutch testing, we have a couple of markers. We do not test the, we do not test thyroid, but we do have a couple of cortisol markers that when they are facing a certain way or a certain number, we, we suspect strongly there's a thyroid problem. So for an example, if you have low thyroid, your hypothyroid, when you're hypothyroid, everything slows down. Your metabolism slows down, your hair growth slows down, your, right, your skin turnover slows down, your GI slows down, everything slows down. And so, so does the ability to make and, and metabolize or process your cortisol, it slows down. So on the Dutch test, we see low, what we call metabolized cortisol. Now the opposite is true for hyperthyroidism. When you have fast or Graves disease, or you're maybe on too much thyroid medication, everything speeds up, right? You, your you, metabolism speeds up, your GI tract speeds up, your heart rate speeds up. So does your processing of cortisol, it speeds up. So you process it really quick and out it comes in the urine. And so we'll see it at higher levels on Dutch testing. And so just those little tweaks of the thyroid, we absolutely see it come through and affect cortisol. Now on the flip side, if somebody's really, really stressed out and they have high levels of free cortisol, that will affect your ability to convert what we call T4 into the active version of T3. It affects, um, there's an enzyme, it's called a deiodinase and your deiodinase gets affected by cortisol. So when I say they're best friends and they talk all day long and they will support each other or get in each other's way, I, it's, 
it's, those are just a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. And I get asked, well, what, what, what should I address first? Should I address my thyroid first? Should I address my cortisol first? Like, what should I address first? And honestly, depends on the person and you can do both. And that's often what I end up telling people. Like mm -hmm. if, um, for, here's a great example. I had a woman going through a, a super nasty divorce, super nasty divorce, high stress, high cortisol. And we found on testing, her thyroid was also hypo, so slow. And she said, do you think I really have a thyroid problem? I said, no, I think you're reacting. I think you have a reactive thyroid problem. And when we can get you through this divorce, we can support your HPA access. We can support your um, stress response. Then, then I think your thyroid will calm down. Mm. But that's not the case for everybody. Yeah. So what about um, in terms of like, because obviously a lot of people want to practice that intermittent fasting. So how does that, how does that sort of link in with like thyroid health? Well, we know that with intermittent fasting, that's a natural response of the thyroid to slow down. So it will slow, it will um, uh, temporarily slow the thyroid down. And then uh, depending how well you adapt or how often you do intermittent fasting, it may uh, rebound and, and, and um, not have any issues. But the only way to know is to do it and then to test. Don't just assume and don't um, uh, guess. <laughs> test, don't guess. <laughs> so if you're going to start an intermittent fasting protocol and you're on thyroid medication or maybe you're concerned about your thyroid, do a baseline, do before. In integrate the intermittent fasting and then make sure you recheck yourself after a couple weeks and then a couple weeks after that you know, really check in and, and see where you're at. Now, some people are so in tune with their thyroid, maybe they've had a thyroid issue a long time. They know immediately. I mean, I have people that know, they'll do something and they're like, oh, my main thyroid symptoms are these two things. And when I do, you know, like they've come back, whether it's um, hair loss, whether it's constipation, whether it's heart palpitations, what, no matter what it is, I, some people are so in tune that they actually know, like, oh, I can't intermittent fast. It brings on hair loss and constipation or other people are like, Ooh, I love intermittent fasting because it, it improves my symptoms. But the only way to know is to test. Mm, of course. <laughs> yeah. So what about, what about um, in terms of like optimizing sleep? Now we know that obviously cortisol is going to have an antagonistic relationship with, with yeah. melatonin. So do you want to explore <laughs> that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, honestly, one of the adenosine is the hormone that um, makes us tired. Right. So aden which is not even, we don't test that on, on adrenal on testing, but we know that cortisol and melatonin have a really big play when it comes to feeling sleepy or feeling not sleepy. So melatonin is made at night. Melatonin is like the moon. Cortisol is in the day. It's like the sun. And so you should have an abundant amount of cortisol in the morning, and then it gradually goes down through the night. And then melatonin starts to rise about an hour or two before you would normally go to bed comes out from, um, well, primarily from your gut, but from in your brain and the pineal gland. And that's what helps us with onset of sleep. How fast does it take us to fall asleep? Now, cortisol is a bully and the higher cortisol you have, it will suppress your melatonin. So for those parents who put their kids down at night and then they take those couple hours to get a lot done or those entrepreneurs who get a second wind at night or those people who are at home, so they're watching Netflix and they're watching all the, um, like all the scary documentaries and all the scary shows, you know, and all the like riveting stuff. And then they, they're like, I can't sleep. I'm like, I wonder why. <laughs> you just, you've increased your, your adrenaline, right? Your epinephrine by watching these shows at night before bed. And then, and then you try to turn out the light and hope for the best. Mm. So yes, cortisol and melatonin, they play off each other. And, and cortisol can often win if you are too ramped up, amped up mm. at night. And even um, just to add to that, as in, in terms of like the, the, the nighttime awakenings that we see with some individuals, um, mm -hmm. Part of that could be that they've, their blood sugars dropped too low. So do you want to explain how, what happens there in terms of blood sugar and cortisol? And cortisol. So cortisol is what we call a glucocorticosteroid. It falls in that family. And gluco, because glucose is the primary thing it does. We think cortisol has to deal with like, oh, stress and how stressed out I am and energy. Glucose blood sugar is the number one thing it affects. And so if you can't get your stress response right, you'll never get your glucose balance right and vice versa. If you can't get your glucose, blood sugar balance right, insulin resistance right, you will never get your, your cortisol right either. So what cortisol does is it, and, and so does uh, epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine, is that they tell the body to make more glucose 
when you need it, which is great if you're fasting, which is great if you are working through lunch and you're a little busy and you can't eat right away. And then your, your brain's like, Hey, I'm hungry. And cortisol is like, no, cool. No problem. I will. I'll make sure to get you some glucose until he or she can eat in the middle of the night though. When, if you've uh, been fasting or maybe you've done something um, like you've had a high sugar meal or alcohol. And so your body's in processing and then you get the sugar drop, your cortisol will counter to try to get you back up into the, you know, a healthy range, right? It'll try to counterbalance for you when you have a drop. Well, by cortisol, in order for cortisol to do that, it has to go up, right? It has to, it has to increase. And so when you increase, then you tend to wake up in the middle of the night because the body's like, oh, not only do I not have enough sugar, but apparently now cortisol has come out to play. So I'm going to wake up now. We must be waking up. Mm. And a lot of people, and I notice a lot of, um, as people get older, alcohol absolutely has that effect on them because the processing of alcohol in the uh, liver does affect our blood sugar and it then uh, has an effect on our cortisol. So I, especially women, I have more women as they enter into perimenopause say, I used to be able to have a cocktail or a glass of wine at dinner and now I find it wakes me up multiple times through the night. Um, same with sugar. I'll have people say to me, I used to be able to have a cookie or a treat before bed after dinner. And now when I do, I find that it, I tend to wake up quite a bit. Wow. Now on the flip side though, some people skip, some people skip dinner and they go straight to bed and they think that by skipping dinner, maybe they're following time restricted eating. So they, they cut off at 5 PM or 6 PM or you know, whatever time. And it may be too long or, um, for that person. So by the time they hit three in the morning, the brain is like, wow, am I hungry? <laughs> like, let's, let's do something about this. And so cortisol goes up to help counterbalance with the glucose. And by going up, it wakes us up. Mm, interesting. So what about, what about in terms of, um, you sort of briefly mentioned some of the medications um, that can affect cortisol. So do you want to explore a little bit on that? Because I actually haven't really you know, heard much, heard many people talk about certain medications and their effects on cortisol. Absolutely. There's some really suppressive medications, which are the big ones. So steroids are the biggest. And um, by steroids, I mean like inhaled steroids, uh, nasal sprays. So allergy medication, right? And nasal sprays for allergies, um, topical steroids. Some people use steroid creams for rashes or things they have going on. The pills, prednisone is a common one. The injections, people get their joint injected with, with steroid injection because it hurts or they have inflammation. And those steroids um, are extremely suppressive to cortisol production. And what people don't realize is they're like, well, I have asthma though. Like I'm just, it's just an inhaler, but yet they're using it often enough and it can be suppressive. Or an allergy season, they're using a nasal spray that happens to be a steroid. And then they can't understand why they're tired all the time. And they're thinking it's allergies or they're thinking it's asthma. Or they're thinking, you know, other things, but really it's the medication they're on is suppressing their cortisol. The other big one are opioids, opioid pain medication, massively suppressive to all systems. It suppresses hormones, it suppresses cortisol, it suppresses all of that. So um, we know that opioid um, addiction is huge. In fact, in the United States, um, the overdose, uh, that the overdose uh, epidemic that we've been having, they find fentanyl, which is an opioid in, in most all of the, mixed in, mo in most all of the overdoses. And so, because it's, it's so suppressive, it even suppresses um, respiration, which is mm. a huge problem. Mm. And then the third, third big category is isotretinoin, which I think in Australia, you guys call Roaccutane. Yeah, yeah. We call it Accutane. Uh, and so that has been shown to also affect the cells in the brain, the hypothalamus, and can result in uh, not only low cortisol, low thyroid, low testosterone, um, and I believe low estrogen and progesterone as well. In fact, the EU in Europe has put out a warning. They did like an independent study on uh, isotretinoin and testosterone because of its uh, um, debilitating effects on erectile dysfunction yep. and uh, libido. And to say that it's, they're not entirely sure why that medication causes it, but it is, it's known and, and to be careful. Mm. And so, and a lot of people did it as, as a teenager, they did it, they took it in their twenties because of acne. And then, and when I lecture about this, um, cause I've done a lot of looking into this, I have so many people come up to me at the lecture and go, 
I, I've never been right since, or I noticed I felt horrible when I was on it. My hormones were a mess. I was exhausted. My mood was terrible. Um, is it fixable? Yes and no. For I don't know the exact percentage, but some people do, can rebound. They stop, they stop the isotretinoin, their cortisol comes back, their hormones come back, their symptoms improve. And other people absolutely tell me they're in their 40s, they're in their 50s, they're in their 30s. And they will say to me, I've never been well since. They're still working on mm. improvement. It's really, yeah, it's really scary to hear some of those stories. I've spoken, even some of my closest friends have um, been affected by rac- Rakuten. And even um, the next one's Finisteride, the um, hair loss medication. That's like. That's a big one. Mm. Yeah. Post Finasteride system uh, syndrome. I tell people, I tell men all the time when they're like, on the sly, you know, they're like, Carrie, I think I'm going to try finasteride. I'm like, have you looked up post finasteride syndrome? I had a suicidal patient. Um, he put himself on finasteride and uh, he was working with me for other things. And he went to um, visit a family member in a different state. And he, while down there, he attempted suicide. Mm. Um, and they, that in the hospital, they said it's because it's because of the finasteride. And it was, the, it, I mean, it was just, it was just awful. It was yeah. just awful what it can do. And mm. so just to be careful. Mm. Going back to the glucocorticoids and part of their sort of mechanism in terms of, because when you mentioned some of the nasal sprays um, mm-hmm. and some of the inhalers and things like that. So basically what you're saying is that these glucocorticoids, they're just immunosuppressive. Is that part of how they actually work? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So if you ever, I have a great chart in one of my lectures that I do and it compares the strength like cortisol is a one you know like then it compares the strength of some of these other you know like fluticasone or like these other prednisone things and it controls the um i mean and then it uh, measures the suppressibility of the hpa access and so if cortisol is a one and 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 you can take cortisol you can take um cortisol as a prescription it's called hydrocortisone in the u.s we have what's called cortef um but you can you can enact the feedback loop as well. You can definitely get above 20 milligrams and then the body goes, that's a lot of cortisol and starts to downregulate your own production. Wow. But as far as a prescription, which is, di- which is different, the, the synthetic, we call them the synthetic glucocorticoid or corticosteroids. Um, this chart is amazing in that it's like, you know, this is four times as potent. This is 16 times as potent. Wow. And that's why it works so well in the immune system is because it's insanely anti-inflammatory. Um, but then it shuts down the HPA axis. So basically takes over, which is why if you're on any of these medications, you should never just stop them, right? Don't stop cold turkey. You need to wean yourself off of them because they have shut down your own cortisol production, taken over. So if you just stop, now you're left with, well, not zero, but like zero. (laughs) Like your body's not making it and you're not taking it anymore. So what do you do? You have to, you have to wean Mm. and uh, work with somebody to help get your bra- get your brain and adrenal access back online. Mm. Yeah, you sort of mentioned um one of the effects of cortisol being anti-inflammatory. So that will that will confuse a lot of people, I guess. So do you want to explain that? Yeah, so 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 in the morning, we have something called the cortisol awakening response, which is when it's our highest when cortisol makes its highest peak of the day, and it does so within about 20 to 30 minutes. And so jokingly, I say to people, I can tell whether or not you have a good cortisol awakening response by one question. When you wake up in the morning, how long does it take you to feel alert? And if it takes you like two hours and two cups of coffee, you have a cortisol awakening response problem. But if you, can, if you feel like you're pretty alert within about 30 minutes, then you're pretty healthy. The reason your cortisol goes up in this spiky manner first thing in the morning is really for good reasons. It's to get your blood sugar up a little to help reduce inflammation. So a big other keynote is when people say, I wake up in the morning with joint pain, but after about like 30 minutes to an hour, it goes away. I'm like, ah, because cortisol is anti-inflammatory to a point, to a point. You can have high cortisol excessively, and then it becomes inflammatory. But initially, and if it's normally doing its job in a normal manner, it's anti-inflammatory. And so that's, so we like cortisol. It, it's, it gets a bad rap. It gets, you know, vilified a lot. Um, and we often think of it, oh, like, oh, it makes me gain weight. No, it's, it's destructive to my bones. And oh, it's, um, you know, it's the reason I can't remember anything. And oh, it's very inflammatory. I'm like, ah, 
that means it's not doing it's not doing its job the way it's supposed to. Right. So, so yeah. What about um? Because I don't know if you've spent much time researching the link between um, certain uh, gut bacteria and and cortisol. Like, is there any sort of link between certain gut bacteria and that's going to modulate the adrenals at all? Oh, absolutely. Yo, yeah, absolutely. And I think that research as that comes out, we're going to find just more and more. Um, there's a huge link between gut bacteria and cortisol and our HPA access response. Mm. Yeah, most definitely. And if you think even just from the vagus nerve, I mean, if we even just keep it really simple with the bit, you know, um, even infections in the gut, you know, uh, in overt or stealth infections, um, go right up to the brain and scream fire, right? Like there's an infection and then the brain goes, all right, let's put out cortisol as one of the things to help put out the fire. Right. So yeah, it can have yeah. a big impact. So what about um, just in terms of supplementation? Um, I want to talk about pregnenolone because uh, mm -hmm. I, I personally, I mean, I, I did experiment with it earlier on, like about a year ago um, in the whole adrenal um, fatigue symptom picture. Um, but un unfortunately, I actually felt more depleted from that. Mm. I felt actually mm -hmm. a little bit worse. And then I real and even my um, ability to hold salt was hindered. And like, oh. I felt like I was actually uh, urinating even more. So it was depleting my, because my issues are really based around like not holding f fluid. I want to be able to hold fluid better because I, I just pass it all out. Right, um, right. And that's been tested through the Dutch test and aldosterone and things like that. But do you want to, like, in terms of pregnenolone, I'm curious to know how you've personally used it. Like, um, Yeah, so pregnenolone is interesting because a lot of people believe if you give pregnenolone, because it's a step on the path to making cortisol, that it will increase cortisol. But in order to make cortisol, remember what I said earlier, cortisol is made in the mitochondria. And the first step is where this little protein called star protein binds to cholesterol and then that converts into pregnenolone. So cholesterol is the backbone to all of our sex hormones and cortisol. So you can't just insert a random store-bought pregnenolone into that mitochondria. But what, mito or what pregnenolone does do, um, and how it is helpful for some, is that it converts into something called allo, A-L-L-O, and allo crosses the blood-brain barrier and works on the brain. So we know that pregnenolone is a neurosteroid is what we call it. And so it works from the brain down. So for our, a lot of people, <laughs> pregnant alone has a very calming effect. Um, it does bind to the GABA receptors. So, you know, calming through GABA. But in your case, that wasn't the case. It was, or maybe it was too calming. <laughs> it was too much for your system. Your brain had too much of a, of a let go response. Mm. Whereas other people will do pregnant alone and, um, <clears throat> find that it really just helps their sense of well-being it helps their sleep it helps their anxiety it kind of just helps steady them mm. because of its effect on the brain mm. there are two camps of prescribing pregnant alone there's the low dose camp which generally keeps it i don't know under 30 milligrams a day maybe even under 20 and there's the high dose camp which is where they usually start at 100 milligrams and go up from there mm. and so um both have their merits and sometimes with people like the low dose camp doesn't work. And so they try the high, high dose camp and sometimes hundreds too much and they go down to 15 and feel better. Interesting. What about, um, uh, DHEA supplementation? Have you like, what's your, your stance on that? So I love DHEA. If I had to pick a favorite hormone, it's DHEA, obviously in balance. It's like Goldilocks. It can't be too much and it can't be too little. <laughs> Otherwise it causes problems. So DHEA is also made by the adrenal glands, and it is also um, really helpful in the brain to protect the brain against damage from cortisol. So if you have too much cortisol and getting into the brain and causing issues, DHEA can increase to help protect that. Um, we know DHEA is helpful for um, other brain hormones like acetylcholine, and dopamine, and serotonin. We know that DHEA helps a lot with mood and it can help with energy. Um, so I really like DHEA in balance. Now, the problem is too much DHEA and you can have those symptoms of high androgens. So uh, angry, aggressive in women, hair growth in places we don't want, um, pro maybe, maybe prostate issues in men. Although I don't see that so much with DHEA as I do with testosterone issues, but still male pattern baldness is a big one. So men will start to get the receding hairline. So will women um, or at the, um, at the top, at the crown. And so 
And men and women make different amounts of DHEA. So women make, physiologically, I think women make, my memory serves me, women make somewhere in the like 15 to 20 milligrams a day, or, or excuse me, 10 to, 10 to 15 milligrams a day. And men make a lot more. And so when we supplement men and women, we supplement them at different, we often supplement them at different doses. So woman size dose is small. Usually it's under 15 milligrams. Men size dose is higher. Oftentimes it's higher than 25 milligrams. Right. Cool. So what about, um, we'll sort of transition into um, Dutch testing because I want to give my listeners a chance to learn more about it. Um, so do you want to sort of break down maybe what the test offers now and also where you think the future lies in terms of, um, you know, understanding uh, adrenal fatigue? Yeah, that's a really good question. So right now the Dutch test, like I said, it, you can do it as dried urine, which is basically you, you urinate on these pieces of filter paper four, if not five times during the day. And then if you want to add in the cortisol awakening response, that's an additional um, salivary collection. So we do three salivary collections in the morning and then around dinner and before bed. And so we give you all your main hormones you're accustomed to. We give you estrogens, we give you testosterone, we give you DHEAS, we give you progesterone, we give you cortisol, melatonin, cortisol through the day. And then we give you what we call metabolites or pathways. So testosterone and where does it go? So we've been talking about like finasteride or um, like why would somebody use finasteride? Well, there's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase and it's what converts androgens into their potent form, DHT. So we test DHT. Estrogen, you've got an estrogen, where does it go? We give you your phase one, some of your phase one and phase two detoxification markers. Mm. And it can be really helpful for men and women who are working on estrogen. Mm. We also then give you some organic acids. So we give you a B12 marker, two B6 markers, a glutathione marker, um, a dopamine metabolite, an epinephrine and norepinephrine metabolite, and then uh, another really nifty metabolite known as 8-OHDG, which is about DNA damage. So if you were experiencing DNA damage for any reason, this marker goes up, mm. which we don't want, but we can look at it. So it's a really nice comprehensive look at everything that's happening mm. with hormones and then cortisol. Yeah. So what about in terms of like, um, are there going to be any more sort of developments and additions to the whole, because I'm, I'm curious to know if there's like any sort of new technology you're excited about or looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of other markers that go with cortisol. So especially on Dutch, we're looking at maybe adding some other markers that just um, are helpful in the entire, like the stress system in general. Um, there, we had sort of looked into and are considering um, like hair cortisol. There's a lot of research on hair cortisol being a marker for um, kind of like rings on a tree, you know, it kind of tells you like where the, where you've come from, how stressed out you had been. So it's a past history marker, adding more markers for adding more cortisol points through the day to really get a more uh, microscopic view of the circadian rhythm in the day. So that's, there's, there's a lot of sort of options that we can go into when it comes to the HPA. I do get asked about cortisol made in other places. So uh, like cortisol can be made, we, there's many HPA accesses in our hair follicles, but it doesn't contribute significantly to the overall amount of cortisol that's being produced in the body. That's the adrenal glands. And unfortunately cortisol, no hormone is geotagged. So I can't tell you if you have high cortisol because your fat tissue is activating it, your adrenals are making it, or your hair follicles are going crazy. Um, we have to take a lot of that into consideration with symptoms and what's going on. Mm. I will tell you one of my favorite enzymes is the, speaking of fat tissue, is that 11 beta HSD, which is the enzyme that activates or deactivates cortisol and cortisone. And mm. so we do have a marker on the Dutch test to help you figure out which one of yours is more dominant. But I think in terms of maybe um, fat loss research, and even just other receptors, mineral corticoid receptors, speaking of aldosterone, um, that 11 beta HSD is really helpful to sort of get a handle on because it can tell you, do you prefer cortisol, yep. which can really have an effect on your mineral corticoid receptors, or do you prefer cortisone? And if you do, why? Why are you deactivating so much? Yeah, yeah. With um, with my my Dutch test, my cortisone, my cortisone was like off, super, super high. Uh, I was deactivating a lot of my cortisol. So it sort of makes sense. 
Um, yeah, um, your body was really trying to protect your mineral corticoid receptors. Mm. So we'll sort of finish off with um, your top three tips to give someone to just support adrenal health in general. I know we've already touched on some of the basics, yeah. but maybe just focus in on your top three. <laughs> so uh, when I'll reiterate from earlier, it's those clock genes. Like I said, the clock genes work on light and dark. They get um, set and retrained by light and dark. So when people aren't taking advantage of the sunlight, they aren't taking advantage of full spectrum light, they're not sleeping in complete darkness, um, then that's going to screw up the rhythm. Not only they're just their circadian rhythm, but for women especially, all their other rhythms. So their reproductive rhythm. So I always go back to that. Number one, use the light and the dark to your advantage. Number two, I heard this, I wish I could remember her name. I feel awful that I can't, but she talks about um, like energetic levels, vibrational levels. And she says that the vibrational level of joy, that's where healing happens. So healing happens at joy. Oh. So I tell people, I know you're exhausted and I know you're burned out. I know you're really unmotivated and tired, but find joy. Even if that's just laughing at cat memes or you know, funny videos that you find on, on YouTube, whatever you can do in your life that brings you joy, f get more of it, be around it more often because that's where, that's where the healing happens. And your cells and your mindset all responds to that. Um, when you're laughing, when you're smiling, when you're, when you're feeling that oxytocin, that, that hormone of love and bonding go up. So healing happens at joy. And then the third thing is to say no, hit your no button and set boundaries. And I know people are probably like, well, give me a supplement. What supplement can I take? And I'm like, look, we got to start with the, with the basics. And I'm giving you permission to say no. I'm giving you permission to say my plate is full. Thank you, but no, thank you. I appreciate you inviting me. That's not going to work out right now, or I can't take that on right now, or, you know, just flat out no, period. That's a full sentence um, right there. And just by giving yourself permission to say no and set boundaries, you can then create space to heal and to find joy and to appreciate the light and to get these routines down. Um, because, you know, I, I talk all the time with healthcare practitioners. Um, if you, you sh I don't want you to light yourself on fire to keep other people warm because you'll burn out. And I say that to, you know, patients too. If you're lighting yourself on fire all the time to keep your family afloat and your job afloat and everything, your house going and, you know, your pets fed and all this stuff, you're, you're just going to, you're just going to burn out and we don't want that. So you have to, you know, keep some of that sacred to yourself, say no. And, um, that will help the healing process. Yeah. There are awesome tips. There are um, definitely things I can implement myself because I, I tend to, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's difficult for me to say no, cause I'm always wanting to help people. And, um, it comes back to that. Like how can you pour from an empty cup? That's basically yeah. what you're saying. Like, um, but yeah, that self care is so important. Um, yes. But yeah, well, that, that pretty much wraps up uh, today's episode. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, a lot of learning for my listeners. But um, if they want to learn more about you um, and your services, uh, where, can they, where can they find um, more of your content? Oh, you know I hang out on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm at dr.carryjones and I do all education. I mean, I work for Dutch, but I do all education. I'm not trying to sell a course or a class or a supplement or anything like that. Uh, for the most part. And, um, or you can find everything I do is on dutchtest.com. All our videos are free. Our education is free. Our, all the webinars like this one get posted up there. So you can go and learn and listen. And you don't have to be a practitioner to watch these videos, and listen to these podcasts. You can just be a hormone or cortisol geek and want to learn for yourself. Mm, awesome. Well, um, thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of the Boost Your Biology podcast. Um, thank you very much, Kerry, for jumping on. It's been a, an absolute pleasure having you on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you.